live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want you to look at this video and tell me who you think the home team for this game is. Obviously, it's Florida. It's called Common Sense. There are a couple of key giveaways from the fact that this is a Florida home game. There is the fact that the game is taking place in Florida. There is the fact that it says Gators everywhere, from the stadium signage to the end zones. There is the giant F in the middle of the field, which is one of Florida's logos. And there is the Gator logo on the 35-yard line. If you looked at all of this imagery and thought that this was a Tennessee home game, then I would seriously question how your brain operates, because this was really easy. All right, now let's look at this video. Tell me who you think the home team is for this game between Washington State and Idaho. You see the fact that the game is taking place in Pullman, Washington. You see the Cougars logo at midfield. You see the end zone saying Cougars. Seems easy, right? Because obviously, the right answer here is, well, it's Idaho. No, I'm not kidding. And it wasn't because of a natural disaster or anything unforeseen that forced the game to get moved at the last second. This was always planned. In 1999, Idaho played Washington State in a home game that was held at Washington State. Seems absolutely ridiculous, right? Why the heck would Idaho be playing Washington State at home on Washington State's home field? Well, we're about to find out. This is the story behind what has to be the strangest home game in the history of college football. Before I talk about the game in question, we need some context to understand how Idaho football was doing, both in terms of their season and in terms of their transition from the Division I AA level to the Division I-A level. Entering the 1999 season, the expectations for Idaho were surprisingly high under head coach Chris Tormey. The year before, in 1998, Idaho was playing just its third season at the 1A level, yet somehow not only won the Big West, but won their first bowl game in school history, defeating Southern Miss 42-35 in the Humanitarian Bowl. The season was so shocking that even Coach Tormey flat out said at the start of the 1998 season that he thought his team was one season away from winning the title. He had no expectations. However, this year, they weren't going to catch anyone by surprise, as he said that the team was in position to compete for a championship. At the very least, to win the Big West in back-to-back -back seasons would be huge. And if they were going to prove their championship pedigree as Tormey wanted, they definitely had ample opportunity to do so because they had two games against Power 6 opponents. The first of these games was on the road against Auburn, and to Idaho's credit, they absolutely held their own, only losing the game by a final score of 30-23. Idaho didn't go down without a fight, and they scored 23 points in the fourth quarter to give the Tigers a legitimate scare, which is all you can really ask for out of a guarantee game like this. Heck, the Vandals even finished the game with more first downs than the Tigers. It was a performance that, at the very least, show the country that Idaho's surprisingly good season from 1998 might not have been a fluke, and it was a significantly better outing than the last time they went into SEC country, when they played LSU in 1998 down in Baton Rouge and lost by 33 points. But the second of these games is the focus of our story, and it's the one that just about every Idaho fan had circled on their calendar for a long time. Because on September 18th, the Vandals will be playing a home game against Washington State, even though the schools were not even in the same level of college football for a while, with Washington State being in Division 1A and Idaho being in Division 1 AA, and even though the schools were not in the same state, these schools were bitter rivals. The distance between Moscow, where Idaho plays its home games, and Pullman, where Washington State plays its home games, is a mere 9.3 miles away. Outside of a state line, there is really nothing separating the two cities from each other. For some perspective on how close the two schools are to each other, they are actually closer in distance than Duke and North Carolina are to each other. Naturally, with two schools that close to each other, a bit of a rivalry is bound to develop, and especially with Idaho, who hadn't beaten Washington State since 1965 and had lost 14 straight games to the Cougars, a win here, especially since this was a home game, would be absolutely monumental. However, I use the term home very loosely, because we have to talk about Idaho's weird positioning in college football and how it made things insanely bizarre. When a school makes the transition from Division I AA to Division I-A, or nowadays makes the leap from the FCS to the FBS, there are certain requirements that need to be met. 
One of them has to do with the stadium that a team plays in, or the number of fans that they generate. For a team to fully make the transition from Division 1 AA to Division 1A, they either have to play in a stadium that houses at least 30,000 people, or they need to average at least 17,000 fans per game. If neither of these requirements are met, then the team cannot play at that level. There was just one small problem with Idaho. Yeah, they were not anywhere close to meeting that requirement. And that was because even if they did everything in their power, and even if they sold out every single game, they still would not meet Division 1A's requirement. And the reason for that was because their stadium was the Kibbe Dome. The Kibbe Dome opened in 1975, and had been the host to Idaho football ever since. But the venue only held 16,000 seats, which was about half of what Division 1A required, and even if sold out, would be less than what Division 1A required. And to make things even harder on Idaho, the games were never sold out at the Kibbe Dome. In 1998, when they won the Big West and had an unbelievable season by anyone's standards, they only averaged 13,289 fans per game. So it wasn't even as simple as just adding a few standing room areas or building a temporary bleacher section. Idaho was in a real pickle, because their waiver with the NCAA was set to expire in 1999. And from 1996 to 98, which were the first three years that they made the jump, they did not meet those requirements. This meant that if Idaho couldn't come up with a solution for 1999, they were going to go back down to the Division 1 AA level. Time was running out. With that, Idaho decided that for 1999, the only way that they were going to meet that requirement was to play somewhere besides the Kibbe Dome. Now, they could have built a temporary stadium that held about 20,000 people with the intent that it be demolished as soon as the waiver requirement was met. It's similar to what Vancouver did when BC Place was undergoing renovations. They built a temporary stadium called Empire Field that was the home to the BC Lions of the Canadian Football League and Vancouver Whitecaps FC of Major League Soccer. It took three months to build, was incredibly bare bones, and was demolished after one year once BC Place was good to go. But Idaho decided not to do that, as that would cost a lot of money. Instead, they decided that they were going to use the school nine miles down the road to their advantage. And with that, they called up Washington State and asked if they could make Martin Stadium their home as well. In 1999, Idaho was going to play all of their home games at Martin Stadium in Pullman on the campus of Washington State, paying just under $40,000 over the season to allow them to use their stadium. All things considered, $40,000 to stay as a Division 1A school is chum change, so this was an incredibly reasonable contract on Idaho's part. This decision by Idaho was done entirely out of necessity. They couldn't afford to play games at the Kibbe Dome in 1999, or else they would lose their 1A status if they worked so hard to get. As head coach Chris Tormey said, it's going to be a lot different, but I'm sure we'll be able to adjust. I know our fans will do everything they can to make us comfortable in our new home. And to Washington State's credit, they had no problem trying to make Idaho feel welcome in their stadium. They gave Idaho permission to put banners and signs around the venue, and they gave Idaho permission to cover up some of the seats with tarps spelling out the school's name. On top of that, they gave Idaho permission to use the field house and outdoor track area next to the stadium. Even though the schools were rivals, Washington State was more than willing to go the extra mile to help Idaho out here. And Idaho's athletic director said on Washington State's cooperation with the stadium, I think when you walk in on game day, you're going to know you're at an Idaho game. Now from a capacity requirement, Martin Stadium was perfect. The stadium held 37,600 spectators, and obviously, even though 1A rules wouldn't allow Idaho to count this as meeting the requirement for a 30,000-seat stadium, since it was not their stadium, it did mean that the stadium could, theoretically, hold 17,000 people, thus meeting their attendance requirements set forth by Division 1A. However, you might have been able to spot another problem based off of everything that I've said so far. Idaho was having significant trouble getting the Kibbe Dome full, it's not like games there were a hot ticket or anything. That stadium was indoors, so weather was never an issue. And that stadium was on campus, so getting students to come shouldn't have been an issue. Yet the stadium was only 75% full or 80% full at best on most game days. Now you have to get a fan base to drive across state lines to play in an outdoor venue where the weather is unpredictable and where it is probably not going to be ideal temperatures to watch a game in once we hit the second half of the season and you have to increase your attendance substantially to do it. How the heck are you going to do that? With the pressure on them, Idaho had a few ideas in mind to get this bold plan of theirs to work. They tried organizing a shuttle service for students between Moscow and Pullman. 
they tried a 12-man promotion, which was highly successful, resulting in 1,500 season tickets and 10,000 single-game tickets being sold. But it was still going to be tough to get people to come to Washington State to watch Idaho play. That was, unless people didn't necessarily have to come there to watch Idaho play, and instead could watch their own team play. Because on September 18th, 1999, in an effort to boost the attendance numbers, Idaho decided that one of their four home games was going to be against the team that they were borrowing their home from. Because on this day, at Martin Stadium, Idaho was the home team in a game held at Washington State against Washington State. Understandably, Washington State had no problem with this arrangement. You're telling me we get to play a road game at our own stadium? get to allow all of our fans to buy the tickets outside of a few sections behind the end zone, and we get to keep our field the same and don't have to change anything, and we don't have to pay any money? As head coach Mike Price said, it's fine with me. I'm glad we can help our neighbor out in a time of need. They do need us to qualify for Division I status. I like the idea of playing them again. And understandably, Idaho players weren't exactly thrilled with this arrangement, with players on the team saying, I enjoy the away games probably more than home games because we don't have any home games. We have to enjoy them. And outside of the fact that Idaho was wearing their home black jerseys for this game, there was nothing whatsoever to indicate that this truly was a home game for the Vandals. But as crazy as this idea was, think about it from a magic number angle. If you need to average 17,000 fans per game, and you're playing four home games, and you do the math, that means you need 68,000 fans total. When Washington State and Idaho met in 1998 the year before, the game drew 36,770 spectators. Let's assume you draw that same number again. That means that over the next three games, you only need 31,230 spectators, which comes out to slightly over 10,000 fans per game. In other words, if you play this game under this arrangement, it's practically a guarantee that you hit this requirement. By playing this game, any stress about trying to maintain 1A status would be all but gone. To save the program, all Idaho had to do was be a part of one of the weirdest scheduling arrangements of all time, where they'd be playing a home game on the road. And what makes this entire story even crazier is that when the final whistle sounded, Idaho actually won the game. I can't even say that they made the home fans happy, because they really didn't. But for the first time in three and a half decades, the Vandals defeated their rival and beat Washington State by a final score of 28-17. Even though things looked incredibly promising for the Cougars after two quick touchdowns in the first eight minutes of the contest, and after leading a 14-0 at the half, Idaho came out firing in all cylinders in the second half, and scored 28 points in the span of 14 minutes, with Greg Robertson throwing three touchdown passes, two of which went to Rossi Martin. The result stunned a ton of people, especially since the man of the hour, quarterback Greg Robertson, began the season as the team's third-string quarterback, and only went into the game after starting quarterback Ed Dean got hurt. Washington State was stunned by the loss, with this game dropping the Cougars to 0-3 and being the team's 11th straight loss dating back to 1998, and head coach Mike Price said that this was the worst of times for Cougar football. However, on the other side, Idaho was understandably thrilled, with head coach Chris Tormey saying that this was a milestone win. As he said, we needed a breakthrough win. We needed to be at a Pac-10 team. We were able to get that done today. And for those wondering, the attendance of this game was 34,783. And by the end of the season, the Vandals averaged over 25,178 fans per game, well surpassing the 17,000 fan requirement and with the team being able to keep their Division 1A status. Although today, they are in the FCS and are no longer an FBS team. We've seen tens of thousands of college football games over the years we played, but I highly doubt that there's ever going to be a home game and a home environment quite as bizarre as this one. Imagine being the home team in a game, and yet you're playing in front of visiting fans, a visiting field with visiting logos, and you're the one that has to take the bus ride over. But I guess this is quite the way to win a rivalry game. To win it on the road and silence the opposing fans is always fun. To win it at home and on the road simultaneously... Well, in the 91 games played between the two schools dating all the way back to 1894, considering the insanely bizarre nature of it, I can guarantee you that this game will always find a way to be remembered. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, 
And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.